Happy New Year, everyone. Welcome to our very first Executive Speaker Series of 2021. It's an honor and a privilege to have you all uh, be part, part of this wonderful event. Um, I want to just spend a minute introducing you to our two special guests, and then I'll leave it to Daniel afterwards to take over um, this one hour. First of all, I want to introduce you to Dr. Daniel Langer. He's the CEO of Equite. Uh, he's a luxury brand value and luxury value, extreme value creation uh, strategist. Um, and he's also teaching a class for us in the spring for those of you who've signed up for his class. It's an honor to have him uh, be part of our Pepperdine uh, Gracidio. We also have Deepak Ori, who's a CEO of the Bua Hotels. Um, and um, they will both be sharing to you yet to get, uh, today about this wonderful topic that I think is an important part of what we want to specialize here at Pepperdine Grad Studio. So welcome to, to all of you, all of our students, as well as all of our guests. So I'll leave it to Daniel now to take over. So I'll be back. Super. See you soon. <laughs> Super. Thank you. Thank you, Abraham. And um, welcome, everyone, um, on this meeting. Um, I'm unbelievably honored to, um, first of all, to be invited um, to host the session today. But even more to have um, one of my favorite um, peers um, joining me, uh, Deepak Ori, who is uh, um, dialing in uh, in the middle of the night from Bangkok. And uh, Deepak is a legend in um, hotel management. Uh, he's running one of the most luxurious, if not the most luxurious hotel in the world, um, the Lebua in Bangkok with a couple of um, other uh, properties. Um, Deepa, correct me, but if I understand right, I think you are the only hotel in the world that has two restaurants with two Michelin star stars. Um, so in total, four uh, Michelin stars. No, uh, two, two stars plus the best service. And plus the best service. And um, so we are going to discuss today about luxury, about the future of luxury. And um, we will kick it off with a presentation, which I will just um, share in a moment. Um, and the presentation is about the future of luxury. And um, I wanted to start with that and maybe give a little bit of a structural context before we go into, um, into our discussion. Um, because, you know, luxury is always a very interesting topic, sometimes a very controversial topic. Um, if you ask probably like 50 people what luxury is for them, most likely you will get 50 different answers. And uh, very often when we are in times like now where you know, with the, uh, with the pandemic, um, we are in many places, parts of the world um, in a almost recession um, uh, phase with a lot of brands struggling. Sometimes the question is even, you know, is this the right time for luxury? Um, what actually is luxury? So I start, thought to start to kick it off a bit with a bit of a view on the future of luxury, also some research that we have been doing um, where consumers are trending. I will try to do this in the next 15 minutes so that we have enough time for the discussion. Um, then I'm going to um, ask Deepak a couple of questions on how he sees um, luxury. And I think today we're really privileged that we have um, like a, really like a global view on that. You will see this in the numbers and in the data that I'm going to share, but also with, um, with our guest. Um, here today. So we will look um, not only on the luxury market from a North American perspective or from a Californian perspective, but uh, really try to give a bit of a global view um, on that. And then um, I would like to ask you, um, because I think from the way how the presentation is set up, this is the um, only way. Um, so we would like to uh, reflect as many as possible of your questions. So um, I would love if you could, um, you know, fire up all your questions that you have during the presentation and during the discussion into the chat. Um, while I will be presenting, I'm not able to see the chat, but later on in the discussion, we are going to go back to the chat and uh, try to reflect them as much as possible. And then um, given that we have only one hour um, and uh, in case there are more um, questions than uh, what we can do during the hour, I also promise that we are going to uh, not leave any of the question unanswered, but then uh, later on um, provide a, um, an answer um, to all the questions that we cannot tackle uh, during the presentation. So a couple of words to, uh, to myself. So as uh, Abraham pointed out, I run a, a luxury strategy firm. And um, as you will hopefully see during the next uh, hour, luxury is really my passion. And you know, when I started this journey, um, I started it as a student. So um, 
in a similar situation than many of you um, who are joining us in this um, in this course. And I embarked on this journey to figure out really why am I personally attracted to luxurious things, so to speak. And I was pretty much disappointed that um, I couldn't find any answer in the research that was out there back then. This was about uh, 10 years ago. So I, I decided that um, I embark on this journey myself. Um, I was one of the first in the world that did a PhD on luxury management. And the focus of my research was what is actually driving the value of luxury? What is driving the value of, let's say, a luxurious hotel like the ones that uh, Deepak is running? Or if you think about a fancy handbag or a beautiful car or so, what is driving the value? And in a sense, why are people willing to pay sometimes a significant amount of their income or their wealth for these kind of products when we have also cheaper alternatives? So this was something that was driving me, I would say now at least uh, for the last decade, if not for longer. And um, so this led to um, writing a lot of books about luxury. I'm also in the meantime, probably one of the uh, leading sources for insights in luxury. We are basically interviewed about probably once a week right now from one of the leading publications worldwide on our insights. Um, and it doesn't really matter whether this is for fashion or for beauty or for cars or for hospitality. Um, and so we always kind of try to, um, to share the latest in, in terms of luxury management. And um, we also work with companies across all different categories from cars to fashion, um, to uh, services. And to me, and maybe as the basic biggest learning in this is that the distance between two luxury brands of two completely different categories. So let's say a luxury car and a luxury skincare cream is much closer than typically the entry level product in the category and the most expensive product. So we really have to, when we want to manage luxury brands in a meaningful way, we have to understand really what is the essence of it and how do we manage it. It's very interesting to kind of sometimes look a bit back into the history to understand where the future may, may um, be. And um, the slide that you see in front of you um, is a slide that was uh, done by um, Bain and Company. Um, it shows the development of the luxury market from 1996 to 2019, so before the pandemic started. And as you can see, there has been a quite tremendous growth in the industry. Yeah, and to be precise, um, over the 25 years that are pictured here, we had a 6% CAGA on the global personal luxury good market. And this is two, two times or twice the rate of the global real GDP growth. And I would say this is pretty much enormous because what this first slide tells us that the growth of the GDP worldwide is mainly driven by luxury and not so much by the other categories. So I think this warrants also a closer look. The other interesting uh, figure that you see here is if you look at 2009, which is a kind of the 8% year on year dip that you see to 2008. So this was the performance of the luxury sector in the subprime and financial crisis. And um, if you look then into 2010, you see that the size of the market was already bigger than in 2008. And I remember myself very uh, vividly, you know, I graduated with my PhD in 2008. And a lot of people told me back then, Daniel, congratulations, you know, you are now the luxury guy and the luxury market will be dead forever. And then look what happened um, afterwards. And so if uh, history is a little bit of a predictor of the future, um, I would expect um, the years 20, 2022 and uh, go going forward, once hopefully the pandemic is behind us, um, to be very similar to what we saw before and also the luxury sector again outperforming the non-luxury sectors. A second uh, slide that is interesting to look at is a slide that JP Morgan created a uh, chart in 2011. And what JP Morgan did is they looked back to the pre-crisis time. So they compared the performance of um, different indicators before the financial crisis and then after the financial crisis in the mid of 2011. And you can see on the left-hand side, high-end retail was back to 100%, just about two and a half years later, while low-end retail was only at 48%. So if we basically now kind of equate 
high-end retail to luxury and low-end retail to more the entry-level segments, it again shows how interesting the luxury sector is because um, the rebound after a crisis seems to be much faster than on the low end side. And if you go a little bit further to the right on those data points, you see the unemployment rate recovery was only at about 18% two and a half years later. And given the economic situation that we find in most parts of the world, United States, Europe, parts of Asia, this growing unemployment rate through the pandemic, it's also relatively safe to say that probably we will see a relatively similar development afterwards with a re relatively slow recovery of the structural unemployment rate, a relatively slow recovery kind of connected to that to low end retail and a relatively fast recovery to high end retail. So in other words, luxury is a very interesting area to be in from an economic perspective and from a perspective of brands. So the question is now, what does the future of luxury entail and how does it look like? And if we take a step back and you know, think about the society at large, we actually see that we are living in a world of massive change and disruption. And actually what we also see in our, in our work is many brands, maybe even most brands are not really prepared for this disruption. So let's have a closer look what is, what are those disrupting factors? Obviously the first is something that you know, we are especially also even, you know, um, witnessing today, uh, doing this uh, presentation, not in person as uh, we did in the past, but via Zoom, we have COVID-19. Yeah? And um, none of us now here around the call knows when this ends. I remember um, in January 2020, um, when we started the luxury strategy course at Pepperdine, I was teaching um, this course uh, still in person. Um, and then, I don't know, sometime end of February, beginning of March, we switched then to um, doing everything online and who knows how long this um, takes. And in the meantime, in this year from then to now, what did we experience? We experienced health, health challenges, even mental health challenges. Yeah? A lot of managers I speak and CEOs I speak with today tell me the number one task right now is to make sure that the mental health of their staff is right. So we have to kind of really think maybe even differently when we do business. We had life interruptions. Some people, maybe even a lot of people, loss of work, loss of income, or at least the fear of loss of work. Business disruptions, the feelings of isolations, but also the creation of new habits, a huge disruptor. But, you know, if we would say that COVID is the only disruptor, we would not look um, uh, uh, kind of close enough. The other big disruptor is simply new consumer groups that are coming in the market. So you see on the left side um, a cover from Time magazine, a couple of years old now, describing millennials. And millennials are those customers that are right now between 20 and 40 of age, roughly. So probably many of you on this call will be in the millennial target group. And look what Time magazine was writing a couple of years uh, ago about you. You know, they said, you guys are the me, me, me generation. Yeah? They're lazy, entitled narcissists who still live with their parents. And we can probably debate this quite long, but what is interesting is you see on the picture, the girl with the phone taking selfies. And, you know, we take this for granted right now, but if we go back just uh, eight, nine years from now, no one was taking selfies. Yeah, it's a relatively new thing. And it has a profound impact on how businesses are made, how brands have to present themselves, how consumers are accessing information. And now we have a new generation coming, the Gen Z, um, and you will see it um, in a second with numbers, they are already quite influential. And I sometimes call them the most influential generation ever. And they're very different from the generation uh, before. Another big thing, a new reality is uh, China. And, um, you know, I was on, on the call yesterday um, with, a, with a large um, um, investment company that focuses on the Chinese market. And these guys told me that um, they feel like, um, you know, China is going to be the only place in the world where you will have significant growth over the next decade. And I tend to agree with this. You know, we have right now about 400 million people in China in the middle class. And in a couple of years, this will grow from 400 million to 800 million. And this is larger than the population of uh, the European Union and the United States coming as new customers into the market, driving the growth of the market. And Chinese consumers are very particular. They're extremely value oriented. They buy 
not just things that have a kind of good value for money, but they want lasting value. They are very discerning, much more discerning than in a lot of other places. So a lot of brands need to think completely differently. The other things about Chinese customers is that they are much younger than in the rest of the world and much more digital. You see on the left side, the luxury market worldwide. And what we see here is green is Gen Z, so those under 20. Orange is millennials, 20 to 40. And blue is um, Gen um, X and above, so 40 plus. And you can see worldwide, we are roughly 50-50 younger and elder consumers, so to speak, um, with millennials being already the number one group for luxury consumption. But look to China, you know, almost 80% or even above 80% of consumers under 40 who are buying luxury goods, dramatically different than the world market. And if you think that or look at the world market, basically the Chinese numbers are in there. And China um, accounts for about 45% of the global luxury market, including Chinese consumers buying abroad. So you can see that actually the world market is even significantly elder than the Chinese market. And in China, T1, T2, T3 are the tiers. So T1 would be the larger cities, T3 the, the smaller cities. About 75 to 77% of all luxury consumption is done by women. Also think about that, how many brands are actually rather marketing to men, but the consumers are female. So we see that very often we completely see the world in a wrong light. We have young consumers coming in the market that are shaping the market, female consumers coming in the market, highly dis discerning, ex um, ex expecting a lot from brands, much more than a lot of brands can give. And sometimes I call these consumers super empowered consumers because first of all, they are always online. They are very informed. They are sustainability conscious, much more than for example, my generation. Yeah, they want experiences. And this is something Deepak, we are going to discuss in a moment, um, you know, how, how experience focused the younger consumers are right now. And they also want to express their personal brands through the brands they purchase or through the brands they associate with. So they see themselves, those younger consumers as brands. And if I see myself as a brand with certain brand values, then of course, I'm only going to buy brands that are in line with my brand values. And now think about the picture of the selfie. You know, if I'm now kind of broadcasting my life to the outside world, what, I'm going, what am I going to do? I'm going to make sure that the image that the outside world gets from me is consistent with my brand values. So we have completely different consumers that are looking for brands, not just as like say something for pleasure or so, but also as a, a much um, larger extension of themselves. The other big disruptor is that we are going from few authorities to a lot of authorities, so to speak. So, you know, a couple of years ago, who were the authorities that were telling us how to dress, how to eat, where to go, you know, which hotel to choose, which clothes to buy? Very few. You know, if you think about uh, maybe um, architecture, architectural digest, if you think about fashion or beauty, it would be Vogue and so on and so on, the Condé Nast Traveler. I would almost say today they are completely irrelevant. And I sometimes like to be black and white because if we still think they are somewhat re irrelevant, much better to think, let's assume they are not relevant at all anymore because people are following influencers much more. So you have instead of very few authorities now, thousands, 10,000, 100,000, millions of authorities that people are following. It's, this is a huge challenge for brands to be kind of in, in line with the flow and to still uh, be able to influence your customers. The other implication of younger digital customers is that our attention span is going down. So I'm presenting now about um, 16, 17 minutes. And this is for many people already a stress in terms of stretch, in terms of attention span. And it's not that we are maybe, you know, as more digital we, we get, it's not that we are becoming dumber and therefore our attention span is going down. It is simply we have to process so many more data points, so many more things are changing all the time around us that we have to make sure that what we do is very, very fast. The other thing is, you know, since um, if you think about your social media feed, your Instagram in the moment I started the presentation to now probably already looks completely different. Your news feed may look completely different in the last 15 minutes, whatever happened outside. So this means 
while we have much more access to data, while we can ask Google for all kinds of advices, we are also much more lost. So as consumers, we are looking much more for purpose and meaning. We feel more vulnerable. And we also see that um, we did a lot of, uh, um, of surveys over the last two years. We see that most managers are not really able to know how to connect with these young, super empowered consumers that see the world in a completely different way. So we have to reinvent ourselves. So what we did um, starting last year is we did a study that we run um, from January through December and we analyzed um, social media conversations, more than 100,000 data points um, with an AI power tool. And we, liked, we tried to filter what are the big themes that are appearing throughout the pandemic that were not there before. And uh, I think this is always very important to see because this basically gives us a kind of guidance where the market is heading. The first thing we learned is health is a new luxury. So before, uh, the five or 10 years before, we saw a lot of uh, um, you know, wellness. Wellness was emerging and Deepak, I'm sure, for example, in your hotels, you have much more demand for the gym and for recreational things around wellness. But what we see over the last year, also with the pandemic, this moved now much more to health consciousness because also younger consumers now, maybe for the first time in their life, are maybe even concerned with their health you know um, maybe you know they catch the virus or other things happen to them so we have a society that became dramatically more health conscious as before and if we want to create value we better tap into this and give them something that helps them on that the second big change is quality of life and i would say this is a huge game changer if I think about, you know, Los Angeles as a city, you know, how many hours are we spending in traffic um, up and down PCH, for example? And, uh, you know, a lot of people ask themselves, why do they do this? Why do they drive to work if, uh, you know, they lose one hour in one direction, another hour in the other direction, or even more? The same in cities like Moscow, in Paris, in Tokyo, in Shanghai, and you name it. You know, we, we kind of start to realize that quality of life is actually something that we have in our control and consumers are looking for this. So brands that are going to give them a better quality of life are going to be the brands that are winning. And the other big change is transparency, corporate social responsibility. And this also goes in the direction of, of sustainability. And to me, you know, the times where lip service is enough that brands just say they are sustainable and then they are not really sustainable. This is not um, working anymore. There's so many opportunity um, in corporate social responsibility and also so much expectation from consumers. Um, they don't like greenwashing anymore. The younger consumers, they really want that brands kind of walk the talk and help them on their kind of journey to having a more conscious life, so to speak. And then the fourth big change that we are seeing through our data analysis is what you, we are all facing and what, for example, we are using right now in this conversation is, uh, you know, we are using a digital tool. So a digital super acceleration and, uh, you know, brands that are not able to kind of walk the talk and to provide kind of an added value digitally will not survive in, in the future. What we see across the board is the purchase decision in luxury now starts digitally. We may purchase in the end in a store, but the fundamental decision that we want to buy brand A versus brand B versus brand C is decided in the digital journey before the purchase. And this means we have to win the digital journey. If another brand is better or has a digital competitive advantage versus us, then we have no chance to sell consumers anything anymore. Um, so this means for brands, if you take all of this together, the change through the pandemic, the change through different target group, younger target groups, more discerning target group, a kind of shift of consumption much more to China with a huge expected growth in the Chinese market. Um, and uh, you know, overall shifting kind of consumer preferences like the health or like the quality of life, it means as brands, as businesses, business schools, you name it, we have to change or we will die. It's very simple. If we are not on the forefront of change, we will die. So the question is, what do we have to do? And there are kind of four core strategies. The first is brands will have to go back to 
really have a clear understanding who they are. And I call this brand equity building for a digital world. What do I mean with this? So obviously most brands have a brand name, they have a logo, they have a, maybe a visual identity and somehow also like a brand identity. But how many of these identities do we really perceive in our day-to-day -day world? You know, how different is it when you really go, um, for example, to a store, whether you buy at brand A, brand B, or brand C, or whether you take airline A, B, or C, or whether you buy car A, B, and C. Frankly, in most cases, even in the luxury space, those brands have become so similar that it's very, very difficult to distinguish one from the other. But in a digital world, we have no ch other chance. We have to distinguish. We have to get much better in brand storytelling. The second is, optimization of the customer journey. So we as consumers experience brands along different touch points. And um, it's super important that each of those touch points is reflecting the brand because only if, I don't know, I walk through the door of a store or I enter, for example, the lobby in a hotel and then later I leave the store, or I leave the hotel, along all those touch points, I have to feel the brand. If there's just one or two or three touch points where I don't feel the brand, I'm not going to have any perception of the brand. So we have to start building the fundamental brand DNA in a much more precise way than ever before. And then we have to look through the customer journey and bring this to life. Consequently also with everything I said before, we really have to think about digital leadership. It's not enough anymore to say, you know, let's do a digital transformation. Let's add a web store. Let's add, um, I don't know, uh, let's get better in social media. It's not anymore about getting better. We have to be better than our competitors. The competitive advantage has to be already done on the digital journey, because if we are not competitive there, we will not be competitive afterwards. And the fourth point, also extremely important, we have to train and empower our teams. Because, you know, especially right now in a kind of crisis situation, it's unbelievably important that we are very close to our teams, that we empower them, that we, um, you know, that we kind of nurture them, that we support them, and that they know that they can take decisions and that they, we have their backs. Because, you know, whenever there's a crisis, whenever there's a situation of uncertainty, there's always fear. And in the end, your teams are your biggest brand ambassadors. Those who interact with the customers are the brand. And if we are not supporting them, if we are not basically uh, being at their backs and uh, helping them to kind of go through the crisis, giving them also a perspective, then how do we expect that they are going to take the brand story and bring it out there and represent the brand? Yeah, so these four points, in my point of view, are of extreme importance. And um, with this, I want to close this part of the presentation and, um, you know, hand it over to our um, discussion um, between Deepak and myself. And then we will um, gradually enter into your questions. So first of all, thank you for listening. And then Deepak, um, you know, we... I'm kind of catching you a little bit by surprise because we did not have a chance to, um, you know, to kind of uh, see this presentation up front. But I would like to get your, you know, honest feedback on this. Is are these things that I was just describing also kind of the things you see in your day-to-day -day work? Are there maybe things that are not here on the list or that basically you see? as a big mega trend that have not been yet uh, mentioned. So in, a, in other words, how do you see the future of luxury? I, I see a future, Dr. Langer, first of all, in a very different perspective. And before I answer your question, I'm going to say two or three words and then come to the future of luxury and then go back to uh, our organization, Laboa. Now, someone has said it, very well that if there were no luxury, there won't be any poor. Okay, means uh, everything in life is a perspective or very relative. So your presentation, what you said is very, very good. Second point is uh, most of the time, if we look at the most successful luxury brand, 
their journey is not how they have begun the reason is why they begin and those who started with the reason why they began have been very very successful others other brands so most of the brands that have not been successful are we say big egos and weak brands now coming back to the future of luxury uh i think you said it almost everything two things i want to say here uh next two years won't be the years of innovation they would be the years of transformation transformation will become the key the most important part here uh which none of us are thinking about it maybe uh data is not uh in our favor or is not provoking our thought process that is right now as for ilo they are 1.8 billion people who are at the edge meaning either there's no job they are at home or working from home uh they don't know how long they will stay in the job saying that i am going to make a very bold statement that in next 3 years and that is for all the students who are attending this course and i'm not saying after 3 years i said in next 36 months the quality people will be very difficult to find because your first slide is very very right that the companies are not ready post covid none of the companies are ready and i will take it back to the hospitality business our hospitality business and why labua is successful uh our hospitality business the asset base is based on millennials uh sorry is based on uh, baby boomers and the whole trend is moving towards millennials every hotel company in the world is talking about yes we cater to millennials and you said it very right that there are many touch points when you enter and when you exit any of the touch points is missing that brand is not ready because customer today has more choice and how people can be ready for millennials and how you can do a service experience now let me explain about service experience at labua i'll go back to labua at labua we have a policy of product we don't have a policy of image and that is why at labua we do not have a marketing department there are two departments that labua hotel doesn't have one is a marketing department other is a training department we also do not have a training department i'll we believe uh, we have 1500 people that our 1500 workforce is our marketing department we also believe at labua that if the brand starts resonating with the people it starts doing very well and when it starts doing very well that resonance starts getting reduced so exclusivity becomes the key along with the exclusivity the scarcity of the product becomes the great thing we can look at that example as a birkin i don't think so it is difficult for a brand to make more birkins but there is a thought behind that and that is what we at labua we always do we create exclusive products most of the hotels when consumer enters you get a house wine where the hotel brand name is written or you get a house champagne where the hotel brand name is written but if you look at the price price is not luxury but even if you look at the price uh, i will not go to the quality they are the entry level product where the brand is putting its name and if you come to labua you will find that if the name of labua is on any champagne or any whiskey or even for that matter vodka that is the highest quality available even until today in the world that is the difference we have created the journey of labua is a journey which has been started it labua never started we started with the restaurants first the hotel came 2 years later when we started the organization in year 2003 we never wanted to get into hotel we wanted to be a restaurant suddenly there was a hotel in the building our guests started coming in and the hotel average rate was 60 dollars and for cheapest restaurant at labua 
now labua that time only restaurants was hand 50 dollars and that mismatch forced us to take over the property redo the property and create labua labua is not about ostentatious it is not about chandeliers it is about service experience we have created a service around the brand labua and that is why many of the top institutions like michelin uh, we are the first hotel in the world to get michelin service award michelin conde nast travel and leisure world luxury world travel awards recognize us they recognize us not because there is a lot of money that has been spent they recognize us because we saw long time back in year 2003 the beginning of our restaurant was not because the service process was not because of anything else but for one reason right of equality for us every customer is vip and every vip is a customer period and everyone is going to get same service irrespective of the fact where you coming from or who you are the name doesn't signifies anything also at that point of time and even today we are talking about 17 years we until today have never sold a single meal or a single drink to our customers what we have sold until today is only one thing an experience that is it dr lang yeah this is amazing and i like i like um, you know i want to highlight maybe two things that you said and kind of go a little bit deeper in in there um the first is that you said kind of everything has the highest quality and i agree with you because um, every almost everywhere where where um, uh, you know you go you get something that is not maybe a compromise you know i remember for example a recent experience at a car dealership and um, i got a coffee like in a paper in a kind of a paper mug and it was like warm and not hot and uh, this was a luxury car brand and i would have expected something that was much more adequate uh, to that um or um, yeah so and i think that there's hundreds of examples like this. so i think this is something maybe for brands to think is um how can they ensure that wherever basic customers come into contact with them how can they give them the best possible in terms of quality um the second is what i really love is your um your really notion that every customer is a vip um because i see this also so often that uh, you know you are uh, maybe the first time in a um, in a brand so let's say um someone let's say never bought at gucci and now goes to gucci so will they be treated the same way as if they were one of the top customers probably not but if you're not treated this way how will you ever become a top customer and i think i really like this idea of in a sense not discriminating but basically taking every person serious as a person and you know to me when we think about what luxury really is and this ex- this idea that we are creating extreme value for our customers or for our guests taking everyone kind of serious and providing everyone with the best possible also service and the best possible experience this is in a sense the extreme value creation this is that i as a person feel as human as possible as well treated as possible and so sometimes i also like to say uh, or to compare luxury really with a maybe unbelievably human experience when we are basically reducing everything to one to this person that is in front of us and giving this person simply the best possible service and in this case it's not always about you know how beautiful a space is how many millions someone is investing in the decoration you can have the most beautiful space and then the service is not good and then it's not a luxury experience and sometimes you can have a, a space that looks like nothing and you just get an out of this world experience and this is then something that you um, that you will never forget um so th- this is uh, i think really great insights i would like you to add here that, something yeah. uh, mm-hmm. uh, dr langer uh saying that uh creating a service is uh going a little bit deeper and with today's context when we say that we are giving equal service it's a very difficult thing to commit 
we are the only mm. hotel in southeast asia that during this covid period we never let even a single employee go like i mm. mentioned in the beginning we do not have a marketing department every employee is doing our marketing so it was very important to retain each and every member of the organization even at this difficult time but what was surprising to me was that the organizations which had their ethos credos and everything that their people are everything were the first one to let their people go please continue now thank you yeah um yeah th- th- this is a this is a great point and one point i wanted to ask you is before we go to the um, to the question of the audience and um, i would uh, encourage everyone who has questions to um, uh, place them now and then we can go uh, through them because i see right now we have only i think four questions in the q and a um, so you know don't hesitate and and fire up your questions um, deepak where are you, what would you say um, with you know the things that are that you see now changing um, over the last maybe two three um, years but also maybe the the bigger trends that we were discussing before what are maybe the two or three three really critical things in the luxury industry going forward to be successful okay, okay. so i'll tell you what is changing the year 2020 was the year in luxury industry for suits to come in but suddenly because of the covid it went into soft tailoring and track suits and sweatshirts and if you look at the purchasing most of the purchasing has gone where the logo is very prominent so so most focus has gone towards not the style of the clothing but towards the brand that is the first thing sec- that has changed second thing that has changed is that suddenly some of the brands have seen that their revenues or the top line has increased and they thinking they have done very well where i think otherwise that is a spending that has been done because these are the people who have not been able to spend money on international travels going out and eating and uh, uh uh private charters or things like that and that money is being spent on handbags things like that now what is the new trend that is going to come the new trend that is going to come would not be a innovation for next three years to begin with it would be transformation i saw you are a huge advocate of digital but i am not uh, i still have a digital department in our organization but if i have my way that department won't be there tomorrow okay uh, i am not a huge fan of digital we all talking about digital and we all talking that china is doing very well uh the reason china is doing very well is because the digital platform at china is consumer centric 97% customer engagement and it is a uh, bottoms up whereas the west that is the us 43% engagement tech driven and top down now these are two fundamental differences also in emerging economies and in the developed economies the laws are very different like if we see wechat in china has got 1.2 billion users and wechat is owned by tencent now look at how they are doing so wechat is owned by tencent and tencent also owns jd.com and another platform which is called uh, uh, i don't know what is it called it's called pin duo duo which already uh, controls 14% of the market share so so digital is something which is going to change uh moving forward uh they have some news that one of the luxury brand has already cut off his digital that is going to change second thing what brands will see changing is they are changing their logos their brands or brand identity that will stop i think the time has come to first identify who your real customer is and uh, people have to do more than ml and ai google analytics is gone because with the covid everybody is on digital platform now look from the customer point of view how much information he has got to digest so analytics is of no use ai ml can help you but you need to connect to your customer coming back to your point understand your whole customer is and stay with the customer yeah 
No, I like I like the 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 view, and it's definitely um, a bit of a and you know it's always good to have a bit of a um, you know of maybe different views on on um, on things. So um, I definitely see digital as probably maybe more important, but I fully agree with you. Digital is not can never be at the expense of of the brand, because for example, what we see very often um, in in projects is that um, if you, you just mentioned Google Analytics, that um, when you, um, for example, um, do like a Google search or Google search optimization, and then, you know, you, you guys on here on the, on the call can make the experience yourself. So Google any brand you want. What you will find is you will find a lot of buzzwords that, are, that can be easily exchanged. And that basically one brand looks very similar to the other when you look at the search results. In Google, and why is this? Because Google will respond to the things that people search most, and then if this is applied to the brand, so to optimize your search results, then one brand looks like the other. And I think this is something that definitely is going to uh, change, and where brands have to take more, um, uh, be much more cautious um, on that. Um, let me go to just to a couple of questions, and then fire the questions around. Um, Here's one question, Corey. Um, as we move to a more digital consumer front, how important is the luxury of digital design? Can we truly create a luxury web experience across all touch points? How important is CRM for luxury brands? Uh, I'm a digital marketing specialist and have experience with luxury hospitality, thanks. Maybe let me share my thoughts first and then um, Deepak, if you could add. So Corey, what I would say is um, if you have to design a digital experience for a brand, always have the brand story, the brand narrative, the brand positioning in mind. Um, because what I observe myself when I'm um, kind of looking at the digital journeys of brands that were, for example, that either we manage or brands that, um, you know, that I like to, to purchase. If I purchase something, very often brand A digitally feels like brand B. And then we are back to the point that Deepak made that there is not really a difference in, in the service experience. And then the experiences are not really thought through um, enough. Why are all the checkouts the same? Why um, do all the sto web stores feel the same? Why do all the website structures feel the same? Why, and you know, if we now think about the digital experience, let's not forget a digital experience always has a physical component. So let's say I order, if we take now products that we would order digitally, I order a product, but the product is going to be shipped to me. So now I have a physical product. And um, if I don't have people involved anymore, so meaning I order online, I get a product that is shipped, I open it and then I use it. Um, the brand still has to create a brand image through that. If also the shipping boxes and um, everything that happens afterwards, the emails that you receive, if everything is in a sense just cookie cutter and brand A does the same as brand B, we are not creating any experience. So my um, view on this would be always think about the consumer, always think about the person, think about your brand positioning and make sure that the person who is sitting on the other side of the screen, so to speak, gets the gets basically a luxury experience through digital means if they choose to do so and if the brand choose to be on there. Deepak, what, is, what are your views on this? Uh, my, mine are very different. Maybe it's the age difference. <laughs> <laughs> so luxury is always about following the crowd. Okay. Uh, and we all should learn from the recent experiences because the fashion shows were filmed this time. And mm -hmm. some were filmed in the farmhouses, great locations, different films. But a real fashion show is where you're rubbing shoulders with the people, you're having a glass of champagne, you are in a crowd, smooching, and all those things are going on. But the point here is that if you go and create a luxury experience, you can have a digital experience, but you cannot call it a luxury experience. A luxury experience is always a personal connect and an emotional connect. And without these two things, there's nothing called luxury. And for information, I have a very different view of luxury. I grew up 38 years back when I was 15 year old, I, would, could, I could only afford one cent a week to rent a bicycle and ride. But it is relative. Now, if you ask me today, do I have enough luxury experience? No, because it is relative. I'm looking at bigger things. 
so 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 it is it is to achieve this you need to have a personal and emotional connect that that i'm yeah. going to say dr daniel yeah and on this one i absolutely agree with you i think that the personal and emotional connection is important where i um where i think that um you know where, where luxury plays a role is i i think that our lives nowadays are kind of so much interconnected with digital and physical experiences that we cannot take the physical experience out of the um, uh, the digital experience out of the equation and um, if the physical experience is in there then i feel we need to make this experience as branded and as differentiated as possible so that it becomes part of the entire experience and um, and there cannot be a disconnect and i see that a lot of brands today have a disconnect they may have in best case a great physical experience but as we also both know how many brands are pretending that they have a great physical experience and in the end they don't have one and so i would say the the uh, kind of on both sides on the on the digital side and on the physical side we need to work much more on creating these um, unique experiences I have one um, one question, um, Deepak, where I'm, you know, also um, as you are maybe less enthusiastic about digital as I am, um, how, <laughs> what is your, your feeling about that? I would be very um, interested about that. So Robert um, uh, asked a question, um, Bottega Veneta, the um, carrying owned Italian um, leather goods and fashion brands, um, they recently announced, I think it was about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, that they are going to delete um, all of their social media accounts. Um, and to be precise, actually, they did not delete any of their Chinese social media accounts. Um, so they only deleted um, Instagram, Facebook, and, uh, and, and so on. Uh, Deepak, to your point, China is so digital um, and all the sales are run digitally. So I think that if they would delete also their social media accounts in China, they would not sell anything there. But what is your point of view in principle on uh, on that, um, and maybe even you know, with the bigger picture, with uh, some kind of controversials about social media, about privacy concerns, and so on, is it for a luxury brand, maybe even for your hotels, would is it an answer not to be on social media? Uh, how important do you think is social media in the luxury space? Okay, I'm going to answer this question in a very different manner, and I will answer mm -hmm. only to the hospitality because that is where. I believe, I believe, mm -hmm. I don't think so people believe, I have some expertise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, now because of COVID, the whole asset class is going to change because we are based, all hospitality models are based on baby boomers and it's moving towards millennials. And hospitality until now has never been innovative. We have always followed the airline. Like we copied revenue per available seat to revenue per available room in-flight entertainment to TVs in the rooms, things like that, okay? When the asset class is uh, going to change, the travelers are also going to change because in next three years, traveling is not going to go back to 2019. First, the aircrafts have to be upgraded or coming to life. Second biggest problem mm -hmm. is not aircraft. We have rusty pilots. A recent Pakistan inter international airline crash suggest as per FAA, the pilot didn't do requisite flying every month. So we have rusty pilot, meaning that load of luxury people is not going to come. When that load is not going to come, we will see a rise of local hospitality players, regional hospitality players. And saying something which I'm going to make a bold statement to the fashion, the next big luxury brand in next five years is going to come from Asia. That's it. Mm. And, and yeah, all I these would, things, sorry, please. Yeah, I would agree with you on, on, on uh, th that uh, Asia will see a rise in a lot of luxury brands. And even during COVID time, we have seen a organic growth. See, the the growth that has happened because people didn't go uh, spend that money outside they spend on the brand forget that the organic growth has happened in two places in asia japan and china and why japan after world war ii japan had the financial independence and their way to show that they are financially independent was 
to go and spend money on brands so people can see that not today buying a gucci t-shirt is not a part of brand for them it is a part of lifestyle for them okay china is even today brand which say 10 years 15 years down the line may become a lifestyle so when these things become lifestyle and brand you don't need digital platforms or you may need minimum digital platforms because once the regional economy starts going to rise and local consumptions are going to take place then then we are living in a very different world now we are talking about like you mentioned bottega cancel instagram but china is different now if we compare china figures to west on e-commerce we see a huge difference also there that's my reason that digital is is a facade we are trying to impress or our marketing people are trying to show that they are achieving something uh, maybe um abram do we have time for one more question uh, it's 12:57 so we have one minute and then we'll wrap up okay um deepak maybe last uh, question um to you um here one of question of the audience what are some of the challenges and opportunities for for a startup luxury brand so in other words for example if you were you once were a startup um many years ago so if you were to launch uh, a new brand today uh, in any category what would be things that you would um, maybe do uh, or that you would consider important right now first of all this is the best time to do a startup because like i said luxury is never going to die it is going to rise okay so this is the best time for anyone who's going to do a startup okay the second thing for startup is there's a lot of seed capital that is available out of west or of different parts of the world if the startup is going to happen in asia getting or raising the money is even much easier and and very surprisingly big brands are going to put money for startup now uh, the question is uh, startup has to be improvised improvised version not innovative version and it should transform from baby boomers to millennials that will be my only advice okay super thank you so much deepak and abraham thank i um, i reach it back to you for uh, sure. for your closing remarks Yes, thank you for such a fascinating talk. I'm sorry that we're kind of running out of time. I wish we had several more hours and hopefully in the future we'll have you back Deepak and Daniel and we have the privilege to have you in class and perhaps uh, you will have more guests in your classroom like Deepak or Deepak again in your classroom. But thank you so much. We look forward to having you again uh, in the future Deepak. Um and thank all you, the Dr. Park. Um yep, thank you so much all the students. Thank you for tuning in. Hope to see you again in the next executive series talk. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Bye -bye. so much. Thank, Thank you everyone. Thank you.